This is the last model um, in terms of the course materials. And um, it's like a continuation or a finality to what we have been dealing with so far. This model will be looking at extractive industry governance, stake, the role of stakeholders and the relationship or the interaction among stakeholders. We've talked a lot about national renewal policy. The previous model looked at the, the regulatory framework from the global level coming to regional, sub-regional, and to the local context. But one may ask, in all the delivery, there were diverse stakeholders. That the extractive industry affect a lot of people, and a lot of people also, or institutions, also affect the sector. So now that we've looked at the regulatory framework, now let us look at how the various stakeholder institutions come to play in terms of um, ensuring a well-governed extractive sector. Just as we always do, we look at it broadly from the global level, then we come to the continental level, then we will come to the regional and local um, level. The main stakeholders from, um, in all the level, being it global, being it regional or national, the key stakeholders that run through mainly are government, the private sector, civil society, and by civil society, we mean civil society organization, community-based organizations, and uh, non-governmental organizations. Um, including international um, NGOs, also have international organizations that support um, or ensure that the industry is well governed and contribute to achieving desired outcome. The role of international institutions is critical. Why? Because the extraction does not just operate at the local level. We are able to add value and come out with the final product. Usually, you will not be able to have the market that will consume or demand everything that the sector will supply. Definitely at the end of the day, there will be some sort of export. And that's where the international interaction comes to play. So what are the international mineral resource governance frameworks and initiatives at the global level and the various stakeholders that play diverse roles? Number one, we'll be looking at the Kimberley process. The Kimberley um, process or certification was established in 2003. The process is made up of governments, business, and um, civil society organizations. The main aim was to sanitize the, the international supply chain of diamonds from um, conflict, um, violence, human rights abuse, and more importantly, illicit financing of rebel groups who um, destabilize legitimate governments because um, usually rebels who take over the mines, um, specifically to the Kimberley process, the diamond mines and the proceed, the, the, the diamond that they get, they sell it and the proceeds are used to finance their um, um, activities, which is bloody. So it, it's a form of um, process that came to stop or prevent um, what is what came to be known as blood diamonds from 
ha having its way within the international supply chain of diamonds. So it imposes some sort of restrictions or strict conditions on all member states and business entities that are members of the Kimberley process. So you have certification and if the ones you have based on some um, uh, international standards, once we have that certification, it is believed that all conscious efforts have been made by the country or the business or the entity uh, involved to ensure that the diamonds that were procured were not procured from um, uh, rebels or were not procured from sources that um, um, are violent prune or that uh, infringe on human rights. Moving away from the Kimberley process, we come to our famous Extractive Industries Transparency uh, uh, Initiative, EITI. The EITI is a global standard for promoting open and accountable governance of extractive resources. It is perhaps um, the single most global initiative that supports or promotes the um, publication of information concerning the extractive sector. The main aim is to deepen transparency and accountability mechanisms within the extractive sector or extractive industry. As we all know, usually I've mentioned again and again, the extractive industry, if not well managed, tend to operate like an enclave. Only the political actors, business, uh, private investors, and a few politically exposed persons are involved, alienating the, the majority of the populace. Meanwhile, ownership of the extractive resources is for the people. Therefore, the EITI seeks to find a way to ensure that information concerning the extractive sector are publicized so that we will have a well-informed public who will be empowered to demand accountability from duty bearers, to demand um, responses from the few um, elites, uh, policy makers, government um, investors, and all that who participate directly in the in, um, extractive industry to, to ensure that the governance gaps are closed. The EITI has actually evolved over time. When it started, um, the EITI report was basically on um, receipts by government and payments made by companies. So it was more like a, a reconciliation to between what government claim government claims have been received and what company also claims have been paid. However, over time, a lot of information or uh, requirements, reporting requirements have been included, which is helping to shape um, the governance structure of the extractive industry. Currently, the current, um, the recent 2019 EITI reporting requirement is compelling member states to ensure the publication of all contracts um, and its um, um, complementary documents or amend amendments to be published so that it will be accessible to the public. This is a critical step to ensure contract transparency, to ensure that um, um, public officials are not compromised in the process because if the contract is there for everybody to see, 
then it's difficult um, and makes corruption a risky venture. Again, what has also been added is inclusiveness. Through EITI, um, governments are compelled to promote a more inclusive resource sector. Now we have um, reporting uh, should include a more gender disaggregated data. That's if you are employing how many of your employees or how many of the workers within the sector are women. These are part of efforts to promote gender equality within the mining sector. For a typical sector like the extractive sector, it's male dominated. Globally, you have an average of 10% of women participation. And most of these uh, women who are participating are even at the administrative level. So disaggregating data into gender is very critical to be able to identify the gaps to inform governments in their policy reforms to ensure that the extractive industry contributes to bridging the inequality um, gap. Again, another requirement that has been added is reporting on the socioeconomic contribution of the extractive industry. This is very critical because many times we see that so many, uh, so much in terms of revenues accrue from the extractive sector, contribution to exports and all that. But then when you look at the socioeconomic impact, it is suboptimal. The communities within which mining operations take place are deprived. Citizens barely know what monies accruing from the sector are being used for. So I will ask, how does the EITI work? Like most, um, frameworks or um, initiative, there's always a working group um, or committee that oversee the implementation of the process. This is no different from the EITI. So the EITI, as apart from the global level, has local EITI, where we have multi-stakeholder groups consisting of governments, the industry and civil society who oversee the implementation of the EITI process and ensure that reporting on the sector from the specific country of interest comply with the reporting standards as have been um, approved at the global EITI level. It's not just about developing the report, but the report should be widely disseminated to ensure that it is easily accessible by the public. Because as I mentioned in the previous slide, the main aim is to have a well-informed public who will be able to engage in meaningful debates and demand accountability from actors in in the extractive sector. Moving away from the EITI, we move away from global to the regional level. Another initiative that promotes good governance of the extractive sector in Africa is the African Mineral Resource Governance Framework. This is a guiding principle or some guide, guidelines that um, guide the implementation of the African mining vision. I've spoken at length about the AMV, and I've always mentioned that if you have a policy or a governance or legislative instrument without an implementation plan or some guiding principles to oversee its effective implementation, it is very difficult to achieve the desired outcome. 
to the Africa Minerals Governance Framework sort of um, create that monitoring tool to ensure the effective implementation of the African mining vision. It sort of provides a, a, a sort of guidance to member states in terms of uh, monitoring the progress of the African mining vision. Now we move to the Open Government Partnership, OGP. The Open Government Partnership is a multilateral partnership that aims to promote open government and open and a more transparent government. Like the other initiatives I've mentioned, it's made up of government, civil society, and, 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 and businesses. The aim is to have a more transparent government. So member states are encouraged or compelled to open up their government to share as much as possible information on their budget, on their fiscal, um, on the uh, the country's fiscal, be it revenue and expenditure, and even having state or public servants declaring their assets or declaring um, what they own prior to um, coming to um, office. These are part of some um, efforts to ensure or to prevent corruption as much as possible. Leveraging on the principles of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the UN Convention Against Corruption. The OGP initiative seeks to achieve um, a commitment at these levels. One, deepen information availability. So just like the EITI, the aim is to make information concerning government operations available to the public as much as possible. We have a more informed public who uh, will be interested in the governance process. Because once you are informed, then you are interested to know more, you are interested to seek responses to um, your concerns and all that. So it's to the, the aim of the publicizing this information concerning the governing process is to encourage active citizenship to also enforce the highest standards of professional integrity throughout um, government. Because once information is easily um, available and easily accessible to the public, then public um, officials are put on their toes in order to undergo or to deliver on their mandate in the most professional and most integrity level without compromising on, on, on professionalism, without compromising on integrity, because you know that the data will show and expose any rot or any compromise in the delivery of your mandate. Again, the OGP encourages the data availability uh, that members should leverage on technologies to ensure data availability and promote transparency and accountability. One cannot just get up one day and say, I want to be a member of the OGP. There are some processes and some criteria that must be met for a country or an entity to become a member of the OGP platform. Number one is that there should be the country, you should already be practicing some level of transparency. That's budgetary and fiscal transparency, making available to the public and regularly updating basic documents relating to public spending, access to information. You should create that congenial atmosphere so that citizens can easily access whatever information that they seek. 
in Ghana in 2019, the Right to Information um, Bill was passed into an act. So currently, if you seek any information that is not publicly available, you can write to the specific institution under that act and request for the data or for that information. This has been very helpful, particularly for civil societies to deepen their monitoring um, mandate of um, the use or the management of state resources. Disclosure of income and access of elected and public uh, officials. I've already spoken about this. You should be practicing some sort of asset disclosure before your officials are appointed or elected into office, the public must know what they own before and after so that it will be easy to ascertain whether those public officials during their tenure in office, did they take advantage of their position to um, um, divert state resources to their private coffers? These are uh, issues that when publicly made available, deter uh, public officials from involving in, in such scandals or increasing the risk of corruption. Although it will not eradicate such corrupt acts, at least it reduces it to some minimal levels. It also promotes citizen participation and involvement in public discourse. Usually there is a score. You should be able to meet at least 75% of the requirements mentioned above before you will be admitted to the platform. We have the free prior and informed consent, FPIC. It's usually um, the collective right that belongs to the community as a whole. That's prior to the development of a mine area or prior to mineral op uh, or extractive operation. It is very critical that there is some sort of consultation, negotiation or engagement between the community of interest, the investor and government. So to ensure that the community members willingly give up their land resources for the mine operation. Although we say the mineral resources or natural resources belong to the state, the point is that the land also belongs to some people. And therefore, if you want to dig out those lands, according to the free prior and informed consent, the occupants and owners of that land should freely agree to move away from that land and give it up and give it to you. It shouldn't be, they should not be under compulsion to be evacuated from their traditional land, be it residential or farmlands. Uh, it should be some, there should be some so, sort of consensus between the, uh, the, the parties involved. They should understand within themselves the essence of giving up their land without any compulsion. <laughs> 